The McConnell tape is disturbing. And I, I have to say, I know he's controversial even within Republican circles because Trump doesn't like him. I think this is a man who served the country very honorably for his term. And he has done more for Republican politics than most in the GOP, including when it comes most especially to judges. So I take no pleasure in, in any of this. But the fact is, he doesn't seem well enough to be a sitting U.S. senator anymore. He just doesn't. And, you know, if we're going to call out the John Fettermans and the, the Diane Feinsteins of the world, we're derelict if we don't do it to the Mitch McConnells of the world. He's not being open about what's happening to him. It's very clearly something. For those who missed it, um, I think we've got the tape of him yesterday, speaking and then pausing, and here's what happened. What are my thoughts about what? Running for re-election in 2026. Oh. That's right. Did you hear the question, Senator? Running for re-election in 2026? Yes. All right, I'm sorry, you all. We're going to need a minute. Senator. Penny. Somebody else have a question? Please speak up. Okay, just a couple points. Number one, um, God bless that aide who was very professional, had his back, was navigating a tricky situation, and she never let us see her sweat. Um, number two, for the listening audience, I mean, he just froze sort of in the way. You ever you ever have a situation where, like, your eyes get into a stare and they kind of fixate on an object and you're kind of off in space for a second? That's how he looked. He clearly was no longer connected to the audience in front of him. And my third point, Glenn, is amazingly, though he w did go back to the audience after this, the first two questions, they, they didn't ask anything about this. What happened to you, Mr. M Minority Leader? What, what, what just happened? Um... And he isn't really offering an explanation, though Sanjay Gupta and Mark Siegel, doctors on CNN and Fox, are both speculating that looks like a Parkinson's episode. So what do you make of it? Yeah, I think we had to remember this is the second episode like this that he has had. I think the last one was maybe six or eight weeks ago. Very similar, where he just froze, was obviously disconnected. I'm not really comfortable with Certainly, I'm not comfortable speculating. I'm not really comfortable with doctors who haven't examined somebody speculating either. I think it's a little bit irresponsible, but I guess it's informative in some way. Yeah. I think it's always a tricky and delicate issue because first and foremost, I hope we are all human beings. We all have had grandparents or parents who have faced the infirmities of old age. And this is something we're uh, likely to face ourselves, every person, every person we love. And so you want to be very kind of understanding and empathetic about it uh, just for being human. On the other hand, this is not just some ordinary citizen trying to work into his life, into the end of his life, because he enjoys it. This is somebody with a great deal of power and responsibility, and therefore it is a concern of public matter, much more so than it would be for a private citizen. When we have people like Diane Feinstein, like Joe Biden, like Mitch McConnell, there are others, too, who are clearly staying in power longer than their capabilities and physical conditions permit. And there is a term for this, Megan, called gerontocracy, which is something we used to criticize the Soviet Union in the 1970s very harshly for being governed by in the age of like Leonid Brezhnev and all the Soviet leaders were in their mid to late 70s. And there were all kinds of valid critiques. If you go back and read those about why governments and citizenships are very poorly served when people just cling to power for as long as they can, well past the time their capabilities permit. I think that clearly is the case with Mitch McConnell, Diane Feinstein, Joe Biden, and others. And I think it's starting to become a big problem for the United States. Yes, it's, I mean, we don't want to kick any of these people out. We don't want to kick them out. We want them to go gracefully into the sunset with our thanks, our salute. I say the same about Diane Feinstein. You know, I don't share her politics, but I respect her. I respect her service. I, she's had some fierce moments that have been fun to celebrate over the years. Just don't make us see you like this. Don't make, don't make us watch you deteriorate to the point of incapacity while you're a sitting U.S. senator to where we have to fire you. We have to boot you out with in an indignant flair. You know, I mean, that's what's happening. And I do wonder, I mean, <laughs> look, I, I think it's a fair question. Where is Jill Biden? Where's Elaine Chao? Where's Dianne Feinstein's 
partner. I don't know, like the, the family, let's say. Miss Giselle Fetterman, where are they? Because I know, God forbid this ever happened to me, my husband would say, honey, you're the bomb, but it's gonna be super fun for us to travel the Grand Canyon and the great parks of the United States together at this point in your career, right? This is what we're gonna do. It's gonna be the fun next phase of life for us. And maybe it's time to step away from the lectern in the US Senate or the microphone in, in the case of somebody like me, right? Where are they? Yeah, you know, look, I actually just had this personal choice, this problem, you know, this kind of dilemma myself. And as you know, my husband was hospitalized in the ICU. He was a member of Congress, the Brazilian Congress. He was running for re-election, which was the choice that he had made. And we had to make the decision as a family without him, because he wasn't capable of participating at that time, whether to withdraw his candidacy. Um, and we decided that we should, because even if he recovered, we thought he probably wasn't going to be able to do the job the way he would want to, the way the people who voted for him deserved. And it was an easy decision because, you know, it's the person's career you're talking about, their kind of life work, their purpose. But at some point, you have to realize that, especially if you're holding that kind of public power, you do have a responsibility. It's not kind of just a theory or a cliche. Like, you do have an obligation to other people to relinquish that power, no matter how much you want to hold on to it, if you're not capable of exercising it responsibly for whatever reasons. But in this case, we're talking about health problems or old age. I do think we want to make sure that we don't just start throwing people away because they're over 80 or 85 or some arbitrary age. Like if someone's in their 80s and still capable of doing their job. I mean, look at Bernie Sanders is just one example. He seems very look energetic, Dershowitz. very engaged. Dershowitz so many is about people. to turn 85. He's like more on fire with more energy than we have. We have. Exactly. I look at a lot of these people with some envy. Exactly. That they seem to have more energy than I, oftentimes I'm capable of mustering. But the reality is that with old age, it's just a scientific in fact that we're all going to face infirmities start emerging. Cognitive decline is very real without even Alzheimer's or anything else. And when it becomes visible like this, it's incredibly sad. It's uncomfortable. It's embarrassing. And I do think there's a responsibility, even if they're not capable, as you said, for their family members to step in and intervene. And I think that one of the reasons they don't is because a lot of times the people in those families are prioritizing their own interest and their own ego and their own sense of self that comes from these titles and these positions above the interest of anybody else. And that's what makes it kind of enraging at the end of the day. So where did you learn about money? You know, budgeting, saving, investing, and spending. If you're like me, it was not in school. My parents did the best they could. Mm -hmm. Not really on the money front. They did nothing. <laughs> But now I want my kids to be better at Money Matters than I was at their age, which is where Busy Kid comes in. Busy Kid is an interactive money management app for kids and teens to help them learn how to earn, save, invest, and spend money wisely. It gives them real-life experience and allows parents to still be a safety net with approvals and monitoring. The more kids earn, save, invest, and spend on the app, the more they build healthy financial routines to use as adults. Busy Kid is great for kids and teens 5 to 17 years old, and everyone gets a personalized debit card to learn how to shop and how to manage invisible money. Busy Kid's offering a limited time special for my audience right now, 20% off a family subscription. So for less than 4 bucks a month, this app and credit card can transform how your kids think about and use money. It's not exactly a credit card. It's like a debit card of sorts. To start... Download Busy Kid and enter the promo code MK to get 20% off. Again, download Busy Kid and use promo code MK for 20% off. There's even a 30 day guarantee. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.